Hello, I'm Simon Benjamin. Welcome to the fifth of my lectures on Fourier series, Fourier transforms, and PDEs, partial differential equations. And this is the first of the lectures when we will be getting into those partial differential equations. So what does this lecture contain? Well, we're thinking about diffusion. So that includes how heat flows in, for example, a solid, but also how matter spreads out. So, for example, how a gas might uh, diffuse into a space or how atoms might migrate around inside a heated solid. It's really uh, very general and important stuff. And we'll in particular be encountering the heat equation. Um, but I'll be showing you that that is actually essentially the same thing as the law that handles how matter spreads out, which is called Fick's second law. Uh, we'll then be using that equation to figure out how a particular kind of uh, scenario would unfold. We'll solve it. And um, that will be one where we can kind of guess the answer, which is a bit of a cheat. So then we'll ask, what if we're faced with these equations and we need to understand a particular situation, a particular scenario, uh, which could be a heat propagation or it could be gas flow or something that's important for research or design, but we can't guess the answer. What mathematical tools will allow us to take on these differential equations? And the answer, of course, is Fourier series and Fourier transforms, and that's why we've equipped ourselves with that gear is exactly in order to tackle quite realistic and challenging problems. So let's go. Right, let's get straight into it. So what I want to do is think about the flow of heat inside a solid, we'll take it to be a solid bar of metal, just for the sake of making it a definite example. And uh, let me just sketch that, and, and then I'll talk about it. Now, I should mention uh, that there are some notes that go along with this course. You can find them, for example, at simonb.info. And uh, these notes have spaces for you to add things like this sketch. So now what's going on here is I've just drawn a bar. I understand it to be a long, thin bar so that I can make it a one-dimensional problem. I don't want to have to worry about the y direction or the z direction in the maths I'm going to write down. So we will erase that straight away. What we'll assume is that however the heat is distributed in this bar, it's the same across the cross-section. But where it does vary is along the length of the bar. It's a reasonable assumption if we make the bar thin enough and so we'll assume it is thin enough. Uh, this doesn't really restrict us to only ever thinking about 1D problems. It simply allows us to get to an equation which is one-dimensional, and we can generalize that if we want to. So let me mark off a region of my bar here that is the one we're going to think about. I'll draw it with a finite thickness, but I understand that in due course I'm going to make that disappear down to uh, arbitrarily narrow. And I'll say that the uh, we're calling the, um, the, the so it's, it's a slice and the left hand side of that slice is at location x and the right hand wall, as, if you like, of that slice is, we'll write it as x plus delta x. Now we understand, by the way, that this symbol, delta x, it doesn't mean delta times by x. It's just its own symbol. We could use a different, we could write k or something. But it's uh, usual to uh, use this little symbol delta and then a variable to mean a small change, a certain small change in the variable. So that's a single thing. It's not two things multiplied together. All right. Now, uh, that's our little region. And also, I want to, so I could draw in some dotted lines, to sort of um, highlight what that is. Of course, the bar isn't physically sliced up that way. We just imagine um, a region that is mathematically defined from here to here. There's nothing special about that region. Uh, there are no actual cuts in my bar. Now, I'm also going to consider a small amount of time. I'm going to consider time uh, from, let's say, t to t plus delta t. Now what I actually want at the end of the day is to capture mathematically how the temperature inside my bar will change because heat flows. 
So let me um, draw a second diagram just to capture the idea of that. There we are. I've put that on. Now, this symbol theta, capital theta here, um, is uh, what we're going to be using, that symbol there, to mean temperature. Uh, it saves me writing capital T, which later on I'll want to mean something else. So theta means the temperature. And you can see I've just drawn a squiggly line here, which shows how the temperature might be varying inside the bar at some moment in time. Uh, so that uh, is against x. Now, if indeed that's the distribution at some moment in time, I want uh, an equation that governs how the temperature will later change. We can assume, for the time being, that this bar is insulated from the rest of the world. So heat energy is not going to flow in and out of the bar, but it will flow along in the bar, and we can imagine that the irregularities will even out. That's our experience from everyday life, right? Hot things uh, cool down until uh, everything is at an even temperature. But what governs that? We have to discover it. So what we'll be doing is uh, thinking about how the energy, the heat energy, the amount of energy that's just sloshing around, essentially, uh, thermal energy inside our little slice of the bar uh, will change over time, over the, in fact, this little interval of time, delta T. So we can also write delta E for the change in the amount of heat energy inside that slice. And we'll need to figure that out. And what we'll do is, in fact, we'll figure, out, figure it out two different ways set them equal to one another, and that will give us our governing equation. But first things first, we need to translate between the observable thing, which is the temperature, and the, the quantity that's really flowing around, which is heat energy. How do we do that? Well, if I told you that our little slice is at a certain temperature, or in fact, if I told you that that temperature changes a little bit, so again, we can use our delta symbol, Suppose the temperature of our little slice changes by delta theta, how much, therefore, has the energy changed by? Now, fortunately, we've already met, you, you'll have met probably a long time ago, the concept you need to relate the temperature to the energy, and it's simply heat capacity. The heat capacity of a material is how much energy you have to put into it in order to make its temperature go up by a certain amount. And that's what we need here. Uh, so the heat capacity is usually written as the specific heat capacity, which is the amount of heat you have to put in per kilogram in order to make uh, the object go up by one degree Kelvin. Let's use that. And that will allow us straight away to relate the change in energy content of our slice to the change in temperature. So what we need is the specific heat capacity, which we can just write as C. But we also uh, need to multiply that now by um, the, uh, uh, the mass of our little slice. Well, what is the mass? Let's say that the area, uh, the cross-sectional area of our bar, oh, we can write it up here, area is capital A. All right, so how does that help? Well, the area times the uh, length of our little slice, delta x, is clearly going to be the volume, because that is uh, just, let's mark in what the area is. That's the area, and it comes to our little slice. And if we multiply that by the thickness, there we have the volume. We don't want the volume, we want how much it weighs, the mass of it, I should say, properly. So then I have to multiply by the density of the material. Okay, well, fine, I'll throw in the symbol rho, that means the density. And then, if I multiply all that by the change in temperature, then we've, we've got it. That's how much energy must enter or leave, if the temperature is going down, our little slice in order to um, change the temperature by that much. So let's just be clear, that rho symbol was the density. Good. Well, that's one way of thinking about things, but that doesn't give us an equation. That just uh, tells us, well, it, it, it relates the energy change to the temperature change, but it doesn't allow us to bring in this concept of how that's happening over time. For that, we simply have to write things down 
through a second line of argument. Uh, how can we get at that? Well, what I now want to think about is that uh, heat energy is entering and leaving our slice. So here I'm drawing it um, in terms of uh, flow in the x direction, just so that I can put it on the diagram in a clear way. Some energy is entering our slice, or perhaps leaving it, but let's call it positive if it is entering our slice um, on the left-hand side, where we have uh, coordinate x. And some energy is leaving, let's call it positive if it leaves, um, at the x plus delta x location. The difference between these two things, because of conservation of energy, uh, must also be another way to write how the energy is going up or down. So if more is coming in than going out, then it must be going up. All right, how, how do we get at that? Well, we need to now relate temperature to um, how fast heat is flowing. And that is not something you've necessarily met before, unlike the specific heat capacity. If we say that we have a, a, a temperature gradient in our um, diagram, so in fact, let me move my diagram around a little bit to help me make this point. What I've done is I've uh, moved, around, moved my line around a little bit so that it looks um, a little bit simpler when I draw uh, downwards the vertical alignment between the slice and my uh, little temperature curve there. So we can see that uh, the way I've now drawn it, uh, it looks like the uh, side of the little slice on the left is at a higher temperature than the side on the right. Okay, um, it looks like then heat will, we would intuitively expect, flow into the slice um, from the left-hand side and flow out of the slice to the right-hand side because um, we would expect that, uh, of course, heat is going to flow from the regions which are hotter into the regions that are colder. But how do we, how do we actually make that uh, specific? How do we make it definite? What we need is to propose a way that uh, the rate of energy flow is related to the temperature gradient. And there, it's Fourier again. So when Fourier was thinking about Fourier series, it was in the context of this kind of problem. He was creating tools, and they're great tools, as we'll see in a bit, for solving these problems. So he was also very interested in heat. And uh, what did he come up with? He came up with the following proposal, which turns out to be extremely accurate. So there we are, I've written it out. It's Fourier's law. What's it saying? Well, Q, the quantity on the left, is exactly what we want. It's how uh, it's the rate of flow of heat energy. It's called uh, the heat flux sometimes. So it's, it, it's actually the um, amount of energy that's flowing per unit time. So that's a power, technically, per unit area. It's exactly what we want. If we know that, then we'll know how much energy is coming in and out in our little uh, period of time. But what's over on the right-hand side? What is Fourier telling us about the heat flow? That it is uh, depending on the gradient of the temperature. Uh, there's a constant, of course, because some materials will have uh, faster heat flow than others. Um, and there's a minus sign. So what this is saying is that when the gradient is going down, as it is in the region that I've highlighted in our diagram, that's a negative gradient going on there, then we should see a positive flow of heat. So heat, in, in terms of the x direction, the heat will be flowing in the plus direction, and that's right, as, we can, as we've argued before, and that how steep that gradient is determines how rapidly the energy flows, how much energy flows. So that's completely intuitive. I would suggest that's the easiest equation we could possibly write down that captures common sense. We know that if we have a very hot object, it will uh, radiate more heat, it will put out more heat than if we have a cold object, or if we uh, raise, in our case of our bar, if we raised a region of our bar to a very high temperature, then um, more heat would flow initially uh, than, than later in the process when uh, the temperature distribution was more regular. That's common sense. That's just our experience of the world, captured mathematically in the simplest possible way. So it turns out that's, that's a great description, and we will use it. But it was Fourier who sort of wrote that down mathematically. 
Given that we've got that, can we now write how our energy content will change um, in a second way? Yes, we can. So I uh, will just write that down. Don't think we need our figure anymore. We can say that a, a second perspective must be that the energy change must be, uh, well, the flow of energy, um, let's put, a, uh, let's say at x, so that's at the left hand side of our slice, times uh, the amount of time that goes past times area. Because, um, as I said, Q is the energy flow per unit time per unit area. So this is how much will actually flow um, in the little snapshot that we're considering. But that's only the energy flow um, in the uh, on the left hand side. We must also consider that it's exiting, the energy is exiting on the right hand side. So we better take that off. So that's minus Q X plus delta X and then the same factor. So we'll immediately be able to simplify this. And let's try and neaten that up. So what we've got is A delta T and then the difference between these two Q factors. Okay, well, we need to see if we can do some more work on that. Where we have the difference of two functions uh, at a point and a slightly further or shifted point, we can use a trick. We can think, how fast is that function changing with x? And then multiply by a little shift in x. Let me show you what I mean. It's easier to write it down than to say it. We can write, this would be true of any function, by the way. It's not a special function of Q, a special property of Q. There we are, so I've written out the trick I want to use. It's nothing special about the fact that our function Q happens to be a, a, a flow of energy. It's true of any function that's continuously varying, which we know, which, so what we can't have here is sudden discontinuities. We understand this is a physical quantity, the flow of heat that will smoothly alter over space. And that means we can safely write down the following, that, um, the flow rate at some point that's a little distance away from x can, must be uh, equal to the flow rate at x plus how fast is the flow rate changing with x multiplied by that little shift in x, the width of our slice. But now we can substitute that into the line above. Let me give myself some more space and write that the little change in energy that we have must be equal to area delta time. And now we have uh, um, what we can see, uh, let me just write it out. There we are just by substitution, but what we can see is we can just immediately delete the flow rate at x and just focus on the uh, last part there. And simplifying that up, what, we'll ha what we're asserting is that the change in energy is area times the amount of time times by how fast is the flow rate changing with x and times by our little shift in x. Now this has all been in terms of q, which is fine, but we really want it in terms of the temperature distribution. And as we said, Fourier's law will help us with that. So this is what we now need to use to substitute that in. Let's put it over here so we can see it. And what that means is that really our little change, oops, our little change in energy. Well, we're gonna have two minus signs that will cancel, that's good. Delta T, delta X, uh, K, our constant K, 
and now d2 theta by dx squared. Our derivative becomes a second derivative. All right, that's uh, pretty good. So now we've captured how the energy is changing by thinking about flow of energy. Let's go back and find our first observation based on the specific heat capacity, which was this one. How are we getting on? Let's compare the two. Well, uh, one of these is now written in terms of a small change in time and a small change in x. The other one has a small change in x, but it's written as a small change in the temperature. I, knew, I want to go more basic with that, and fortunately, it's easy to do. I can simply recall that uh, a small change in temperature must be just how fast is temperature changing with time times how much time has gone by. And with that substitution, we're now ready to equate these two things and see what we've got. I'll do that now. There we are. Now we can see we're going to get some very nice uh, simplification by cancelling quantities. Now, the rules we wrote down were true um, in the limit that these quantities, uh, the small change in time and the small change in x, were um, infinitesimal. But we can uh, just imagine that uh, we're making them smaller and smaller, but keeping them, of course, the same on both sides of this equation. So at any point, we can just cancel those out. So there we are. That's a lot of nice simplification. We also notice that the area cancels because it was important both in thinking about this specific heat capacity way of looking at things and the flow of energy way of looking at things. All right. Well, now, what have we got if we tidy this up? We have this expression. Uh, fairly neat. Doesn't look like it's necessarily going to be all that easy to work with. It is a partial differential equation, but it's uh, not too bad. And we can see that K... Uh, the heat capacity C and the density rho are all just constants. So to make things uh, neater, we could just use the symbol alpha to represent that particular combination of constants, making our equation easier on the eye and uh, more compact to work with. But there we are. That is the heat equation. We've got it. Uh, that there. Let's give it a label. Now we have our heat equation. I mentioned that diffusion of matter, such as a gas spreading out, is exactly the same mathematics. If the mathematics is the same, the, the formal word for that would be isomorphic. It mathematically has the same form. But uh, what is the equation? We may as well write it out. Uh, it's a good time to do so. So this would be called Fick's second law. So there it is. You can see how similar it is. I've just used different symbols, essentially, and written the same equation. So we now have a capital D which is the uh, diffusion coefficient for the material or gas that we're considering. And we have uh, a symbol here. I've used phi, but it may be written in other ways. That now means the density of the diffusing substance, which is instead of our, our temperature distribution. But the form of it, that it is a second derivative with respect to um, x and a first derivative with respect to time, is, uh, is the crucial thing that makes it the same. So this is fix. Second law in one of its forms. There we are. All right, so we've got it. We've got the heat equation. How does that help? Well, it helps a great deal. This is going to govern how temperature evolves in any situation that we care to think about. So let's think about one and see if we can uh, sort, it, sort out the maths. I want to think about a bar that's actually an infinite bar because I don't want to have to worry about the limits, the boundaries of the bar for our first example. So we'll say it's an infinite bar, but we're looking at some point along the length of this infinite bar, and we'll call that x is equal to zero. Now, I want to imagine that I take a blowtorch, and so, okay, my bar is going to be at some temperature, uh, let's call it um, theta c, so theta subscript c, um, before our story begins. But then, also before our story begins, I've taken a blowtorch and uh, heated the region around x is equal to zero. And then I switched the blowtorch off, and now our story actually begins. 
Now to make it something, as this is just our, our first example, in order to make it something we can handle, I'm going to assume that the mathematical description of the temperature is uh, a nice simple one that approximately matches the story I've just told. So what would I draw for that? I'm going to say that the temperature, so this is x equals zero middle point, the temperature uh, initially has this distribution. It's simply a Gaussian. So what is a Gaussian? It goes as e to the minus x squared. I haven't drawn it, let me try draw it a little bit better, but again it's kind of tough to draw with the um, just freehand. So what this is, is e to the minus x squared. So it falls off according to uh, the square of x. It's a very, very common function that we write down, and often it's mathematically quite a friendly one to work with. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to, to, to get somewhere with this as our initial distribution. So it's not 100% realistic because... Um, it, it never quite falls down, uh, to, it never, the gradient never quite goes away, right? So it, it, it's, it's still slightly changing at any distance out in x, which sounds a bit wrong for a blowtorch that was only on for a while, but it's pretty good. It's giving us a, 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 a raised temperature in the center of our region, and um, it's giving us, uh, and it drops off in a kind of smooth way. So it's a pretty good first effort. Um, in fact, I should shift it up a bit. Let's do that. Okay, I fixed up our figure a little bit uh, because I did say that the bar was at the cold temperature before the blowtorch uh, acted, so that must be the lowest that our, our, our temperature distribution will go to, and it is peaking up to uh, what I'm calling theta h, the hot point in the center of where I was focusing the blowtorch. So actually, I need to, um, let's, let's, let's see if we can start writing out what is our temperature distribution at the beginning of our story. Well, I want it to be uh, the cold temperature plus a boost to the temperature, which I could use uh, this capital delta symbol for. And I'll say that's the initial boost is multiplied by e to the minus x squared. So now at x is equal to zero, I get the full effect of that boost. And since I know that want, I want that to come out as the hot temperature, I can write that uh, delta initial, um, the initial boost is just the difference between the hot and the cold temperatures. And that will work because if I put in x, x is equal to zero, that will give me what I want. On the other hand, as x goes off to infinity or minus infinity, e to the minus x squared becomes zero and I just have the cold temperature. That's what I want. There's one extra ingredient though. Um, I want the width of this distribution. Mm, let's use another color here. Uh, I want to be able to say what that is because, uh, you know, I want to be able to choose my own scale for that. Maybe it's roughly a centimeter wide, the region I've been blasting with my blowtorch. Or maybe I used a massive wide blowtorch and it's 10 or 100 centimeters wide, right? So uh, what is that? I'll say that um, I'm going to introduce a symbol L for the initial characteristic width. Of course, it doesn't have a sharp width because this is this this gradually decays down to zero but if i were to introduce to my uh distribution if i divided x by some constant l for the initial distribution that would do it because that would set a kind of length scale it would mean that x needs to be um l in order for the temperature to have dropped off by a factor of e and if it's um uh if x is 2l, then we'll have dropped off by a factor of uh, e to the minus um, uh, uh, 2 squared, e to the minus 4. So l now sets our characteristic length. We're going to want that. And I'm using l in it. I've written in it, meaning initial, on all these things because I know that things are going to change. But that's how I want my initial distribution to look. All right. How would we proceed? So I'm not going to do the line by line detailed derivation, but I'm going to outline how we might get there. Um, what we're going to do is take a guess, which is always a great way to solve a differential equation. You guess what the answer might be. You try it out. 
you uh, use you then uh, fix any variable elements of your guess and hopefully if your guess was a good one that's a legitimate solution that is a perfectly solid way to solve differential equations it does leave us with the puzzle of what to do if we didn't have a good guess but we'll come on to that so what should we guess in this case what would you think will be um, the shape of the distribution at a later time actually in speaking of time I'm going to say that the moment when I turn my blowtorch off, I'm going to say that that happens at time t init. Uh, so I'm using this subscript init to mean initial in each case, the initial um, height of the temperature uh, change and the initial width of it and also the time. Now, why am I not just saying, look, let's just call it time t equals zero. It's actually because I know where the equations are going to take us and it will be convenient to be able to just say, oh, the initial moment is at so-and-so time. Of course, we don't care, right? I mean, I can, it's the same physics, whether I call the first moment t equals zero or t equals 10 or t equals 57.3. The point is, how will it change as time progresses? By allowing myself uh, the freedom to later pick what I call that first moment, it will just make the solution simpler. And they, you know, they're gonna, <laughs> they aren't all that simple. So we want that. Okay, so that's fine. T in it is the moment when uh, the blowtorch goes off and the temperature can start to redistribute itself. All right. What? Um, how? How do we get any further? We have to guess a solution. We have to uh, guess what's going to happen. Here's my guess. I think the shape, the Gaussian shape, is going to stay there. It's just going to spread out more and more. I don't see why my heat distribution should change radically into any other kind of shape. It's already a kind of slowly, smoothly evolving, um, smoothly shaped thing. Maybe it will just stay shaped like that, but spread out more and more. Let me sketch what I mean. There, I've uh, drawn a second sketch. So the one at the top here is just our distribution at what we're calling t in it, the initial moment that the blowtorch goes off. So we have our full height of our um, temperature irregularity in the center of the bar, and it has this characteristic width L. And now what I'm proposing things look like, look like at a later time is that we still have the same kind of distribution, but it's dropped down so the peak temperature is less, and it's broadened out. So our equivalent to L, which characterizes how wide it is, is now a larger number. That's my guess. Let's see if it works. So I now have to write down my proposed form for the temperature distribution as a function of both space and time and see if we can make it work. There we are. That's my proposal. It's the, it's the same kind of expression we were having before, except I've allowed now the characteristic width L to become a function of time. I know what it should be at the initial time, but I'm saying that it's going to go up over time. And the delta, which was giving me the height of that temperature peak, I'm also making a function of time. All right, that's my guess. Can I relate these two quantities? Um, I, I don't think I can write down yet what they are, but can I at least form a relationship between uh, this quantity the way that the width of the distribution changes in time and this quantity, the way that its height changes in time. I actually should be able to do that even before I, I go and bring out our heat diffusion equation and plug it in. And the reason is that I'm assuming heat isn't escaping from the bar, it's just flowing along the bar. So the total amount of heat that I introduce from my blowtorch is always inside the bar conserved. It's just spreading out more. So what that means is, if I were to integrate over the full length of the bar, multiply my temperature by the specific heat capacity to translate from a temperature into how much energy, that should be conserved. So what that, what that practically means is, the area under these two curves that I've drawn must be the same. As it gets wider, it must get lower in a way that conserves the area. Now, I could take us through the, the, the careful argument for why the following is the case, but I'm just going to say that um, the way that uh, the width and the height must be related 
if the area is going to stay the same is what you would guess, which is simply that uh, the width must be proportional to, that's a proportional sign, um, 1 over the, sorry, the height is proportional to 1 over the width, so that the product of the two stays the same is another way of thinking about it, right? So as we make it wider, we correspondingly make it uh, uh, shorter. Twice the width, half the height. It's what you would expect, and I'm telling you it is correct. So we can, in fact, substitute um, in and simplify our guess, at least reduce the number of unknown quantities, and then put it into our diffusion equation. So there we have it. That's my guess. You can see what I've done there. I've uh, used our initial height and width of the distribution um, to substitute in, so that now you can see that um, as this quantity here, how our width varies with time, when we put in its initial width, then that's just going to cancel top and bottom and give us our initial um, height. And so that, that works out. But now, in order to see if we can really solve our diffusion equation using this form, we need to uh, try it. What happens when we plug our expression into that? Well, the differentials, whether they be partial by x or partial by t, will certainly get rid of the constant, which is our um, cold temperature of the bar. That's fine. And we can also see that any constants that multiply the actual function part will also cancel. So these, whoops, these will also cancel and we'll end up with just the interesting core of it. So let me quickly write that out. Okay, that's what we have to somehow make work with the right choice of how the width varies with time. We're asking, is there any way we can choose L as a function of T that will make this equation work? If yes, then we've guessed the right approach. If no, then it was wrong to say that the shape will stay a Gaussian. All right, well, what will happen? So we could write it out and we'd have Four terms in total, two on the left, two on the right. I'm just going to tell you what that would simplify down to if we didn't make any slips. What would um, our uh, uh, condition turn into? Well, after admittedly quite a lot of tidying up of those four terms, what we would find is the following very compact expression. Provided that we can think of some function L of t that satisfies the following, we're done. The partial of this function with respect to time is equal to just 2 alpha, remember alpha is a constant, divided by the function. So roughly we're asking, what is it that when you differentiate it, it's equal to 1 over the original function? Well, uh, I'll give you a second to think about that. Well, what you may have spotted is that if you take the derivative with respect to time of something that goes like t square root of t, t to the half, then that will become a half t to the minus a half. And so um, that's, that's our trick. That's what we need to do. That tells us um, how we're going to solve this. And all we have to do is just make sure that um, alpha factor comes out correctly. What we'll end up then is the following. We simply find that our uh, our length as a function of time must be just two times the square root of alpha times t. And let me paste in for you a little check argument for that. So what we find is that when we take that differential, just to make sure we've got the constants correct, then we can rewrite we can write the answer in this way, and that thing on the bottom is indeed just L of t again. So we satisfied our expression. So that's what it needs to be in order for our guess to indeed have been correct. Good. So now we can uh, write out our final expression. But just before do we do that, we gave ourselves the freedom to have uh, different uh, to, to to have uh, to define the starting point of time as just t in it. And we said, well, we don't care. We don't care what we call the first time moment. We just care how it evolves in time. So now we can actually find out what we should, <laughs> what we should call that first moment when the blowtorch switches off, because uh, 
we know that the length at t is equal to t initial should be just the initial length. But now we have that function, so we can uh, substitute that in, and what we're saying is that 2 times the square root of alpha t initial is equal to L initial. In other words, that t in it, uh, the moment our clock watch, clock, our <laughs> stopwatch, or clock, one or the other, but not both, uh, is equal to simply um, uh, square and divide, so that's going to be uh, 1 over alpha L in it over uh, 4 squared. There we are. So that's our initial moment. But that's not very important. Uh, that's just good to get that nailed down. Let's write out our expression that we have deduced must be, with that use of uh, our initial time, what are we saying? What was this guess that has worked out? Let's write it all out <laughs> so that we are done. There we are. That is it. Uh, it's a Gaussian. It has uh, e to the minus x squared divided by some constant times time. Uh, that's the core of the thing. Out in front, we have a bunch of constants that make it work. And again, we're dividing by now the uh, square root of time, um, which is showing us how the height of the function must be dropping, that the peak temperature is dropping um, with the square root of time. Okay, so we've our guess worked. It was a bit of effort, and I even skipped over some of the uh, you know some of the working and just told you how things tidy up. Uh, but at least um, it is possible to solve our diffusion equation in the way that we often solve differential equations, which is just ma making a good guess and showing that that guess works. And uh, it's quite a nice example, actually. Now, just before we move on, here's a nice little fact. By solving that problem, we've solved a second one for free. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so the diagram above is the one we've been working on. It's our infinite bar that got blowtorched in the middle of the bar. What have I drawn below? I've drawn um, the initial distribution of temperature I might consider for a different problem. This would be um, a bar which goes off to infinity in, let's say, the positive x direction, but, but stops at x equals zero. It would be called a semi-infinite bar, if you want to think of it that way. And what I've done is I've imagined that I've heated up the end of the bar by just blowtorching, let's say, right onto the end of it. So um, there, the initial distribution at some initial moment is that it's hottest at the end of the bar and it drops off going into the bar. And then I ask, how does that, after I switch the blowtorch off, same, same story, how does that heat distribution, how does the temperature distribution in particular change? Well, that might, it's clearly a similar problem. I've also started with a Gaussian um, uh, a kind of initial distribution, but you might think we have to go back to basics and think about it all over again, because now it's not the midpoint of a bar, it's the end of it. But actually, symmetry allows us to see that the solution is exactly the same, exactly the same. It's just that it, the bar is not defined for minus values of x, so we ignore the function at minus values of x, but wherever we have our bar existing for all positive values of x, it's exactly the same expression this one uh, that we just derived. Why? Well, have a think about heat, how heat must be flowing in the original problem that we did solve. It's never the case that any heat can flow from the left-hand side of the diagram into the right-hand side of the diagram. That never happens because of the symmetry of the problem. It's always the case that the hottest point in our distribution is that x is equal to zero. Heat is flowing out of that region, actually symmetrically. If we imagine a little slice of material at x equals zero, the, the heat will be flowing out of that equally to the left and right, but it will never be flowing in. So we can just slice our problem right at that point and everything follows through. The heat can only move um, from uh, the left to the right in the positive x region. So by cutting our problem in half, we actually haven't altered anything at all. So that's something to think about.
but that is a, an example of how powerful it can be to just notice a symmetry in the problem. Here, the symmetry is that x equals 0 is special, and heat only ever flows out of a little region around x equals 0 and never in. So if we cut it so that there is no region on one side, it doesn't make any difference because no heat was flowing in there anyway. So the gas worked great, um, but what do we do? if we can't guess our way to the answer. Well, there is another lesson that we should just quickly learn from our solution here. What happens when time goes to uh, arbitrarily large, a very large values, time goes to infinity? Well, we can see that this will become e to the power of zero, which is just one. But here's another factor of time, which is dividing this second part of our equation. And so that will uh, become divided by a huge number and disappear. So in the end, for very large values of time, we will just have our bar at its colder temperature. And that makes sense because we in just injected a finite amount of heat into an infinite bar. And when it's finished spreading out, the temperature won't have changed by any finite amount from its original cold temperature. There's a phrase for the part that um, or the part of a temperature distribution that um, exists in the infinite time limit when things have completely settled down. It's just called the steady state. And then the interesting bit that captured for us how things were different from the steady state at the beginning and that gradually decayed away and changed, that's this whole part here. Now it would be called the transient. In other words, temporary part of our solution. So our solution has a steady state part and a transient part. That is very often going to be the case when we try and solve more general problems that we can't guess our way to. Now in order to think about how we might tackle general problems, what I'm going to do is go and get one of our diffusion equations and we'll have a hard stare at it. So we had two of them. One of them was uh, the equation, the heat equation. And the other was our fixed second law, which is for the diffusion of matter. Uh, we were working with heat before, so let's this time take a turn. Um, doesn't clearly doesn't matter which one I choose. Mathematically, they're the same. And let's whiz down and take a look at it. Take a hard look and figure out what might be a way into it if I were given an initial distribution of, say, gas spreading out into a chamber. It initially has some specific distribution, or even just gas along a pipe to make it a 1D problem, how would I solve it if I couldn't guess the form of the solution? It would be tough, or it seems like it would be very tough. Is there anything I could say to start to make some progress? Well, I could restrict myself to a very artificial case and then hope to be able to generalize. That's always a good technique uh, to see that you can do something, understand that, and then try and broaden it. What would be that very special and limited initial case? It would be the following. If I assume that the distribution, the density of my material, varies in time and space just as a product of something that only depends on time and something that only depends on space, on x, that is a huge restriction. By the way, our uh, solution that we were just working with certainly doesn't meet that condition because we can see that x and time are interlaced with each other, even just inside the exponential there. We certainly couldn't have written our previous solution that way, and that's a hint that this is a hugely constraining assumption. But still, let's go with it and see where it takes us. It's going to help because the partial differentials, the partial differential in x will ignore the time part now and regard it as just a constant, and similarly, the partial differential in time will ignore the space part. Let's write out what we get. Well, that's that's what we get. We find that our partials are now, as promised, just acting on the parts of the product that they care about. And that does allow us to do a further simplification. We can actually remove the partial differentials now and write it as total differentials because when a partial acts on something which is purely depending on the variable that it's interested in, then it's the same as doing a total differential. So that, uh, you know, maybe that's helped a bit. But um, it still looks pretty tricky. 
Now the next move seems like it's going to make things worse, but it'll actually make it much better. <laughs> I'm going to divide both sides of my equation by the complete function um, and actually by the constant d as well. So I'm going to divide both sides by capital X and capital T and see what we get. There we are. It doesn't seem to have made things much nicer. Um, now I've got one over some functions, but it in fact has made a profound difference because what we can see is that the object on the left is only a bunch of functions of x. There is no mention of time at all on the left. And over on the right, remembering that capital D is just a constant, we've got stuff that varies with time but makes no mention at all of x. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, but how does that help? It helps in the following way. The, this equation has to be true for all values of time and all values of space because we're just taking the diffusion equation all of time and space for our problem and um, uh, just substituting in a particular form of solution that, okay, it's a special form of solution, but it's a, a perfectly reasonable thing to put down. How can it be the case that this this line is true because if I fix time, I'm allowed to vary time and space however I like, and this has, has to stay true. If I fix time and just vary the x coordinate, then the right hand side stays fixed, and I'm varying the x ver um, in the left hand side, but it can't change because the right hand side stays fixed. And similarly, if I were to fix x and vary time, in fact, everything on the right would have to, despite the fact I am changing the t variable that goes into it, it can't change because the thing on the right wouldn't be changing. So the only way that this can be true for all values of x, little x and little t, of x of space and time, is if, in fact, the equation is equal to a constant. Both sides are just equal to some constant. You might want to pause and think about that because it's, it's not a completely straightforward idea, but it follows from the fact that we've got all the x stuff on one side, all the time stuff on the other, and yet it mu the equation must be true for all values of x and t. What constant am I going to choose? I'm actually going to choose the constant minus k squared. I have to clearly put down some symbol. Um, and so what we've discovered is this whole, both sides must be equal to just some constant I could write a constant k. I'm choosing minus k squared because I know that that will just make the following equations neater. Let's write them out. What do we get when we now can take this apart into two separate equations, one that's just time and one's just space? Okay, there they are, and this looks uh, much more doable, right? So um, now two simple equations that I can just write down the answer to probably because they're pretty simple differential equations what is it that capital X needs to be in order to um, in order that the second differential of X is equal to minus K squared times the original function? Well, actually, it's sine or cos. If you take the differential twice, you get back from cos back to cos and from sine back to sine, and you pick up a minus sign. If there's a k squared out in front, it must be that it was sine k or cos k. So the general solution would be, for example, some combination of sine and cos. We could write it as a sine, uh, well, let's do cos first, a cos of k x plus b of sine of k x. And how about this time function? What function uh, can we take the derivative of and just get the same function itself? It hasn't changed, except that a constant has popped out. Well, what function doesn't change when you take the derivative? An exponential. So we can write down that the solution to this, in general, must be that the time function is equal to the e to the minus, oh, I could put a, a constant in front, say c, capital C, um, e to the minus, k squared t. All right, so there we are. We've 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 done it. <laughs> we've done it for a really a really really simple case, but 
if, if we're dealing with a problem where the solution happens to be separable in that it's just time, it's, uh, a thing that varies with time and a thing that varies with uh, space, if this is a val if this is the answer, at least we know what the forms of those things can be. Um, so let's just write out what we're saying in one line. We're saying that uh, one kind of solution, at least, to this diffusion equation, one way to go would be... Well, now, actually, I'm, I'm now going to just write out these things multiplied by each other, but I can see that I've got too many unknown constants. Um, if I'm going to make the product of these things, then uh, that would be A cos kt, uh, excuse me, kx, plus b sine kx. And I'm multiplying by some unknown constant c e to the minus k squared t. But I can see that I didn't really need to have that third constant, right? Because any freedom that I get by uh, being allowed to choose this constant c, I could have just absorbed into different choices of a and b, which I'm also free to choose. So that's a little bit, once you multiply them together, you realize you don't need the c. So let's just delete that one. But there we are, that's it. So that is one kind of solution. Any uh, Anything that fits that form will be a legit uh, solution to our diffusion equation. In fact, if I can think of an initial condition, if, here's a way to ask it. What kind of problems have we solved by doing this little analysis? Well, let's set time t equal to zero, or to any fixed number, but let's set it equal to zero. Well, then the exponential uh, part will just vanish. So we have just figured out a rather limited thing, which is that any problem which um, at its initial uh, point can be written as a cos term combined with a sine term. So what am I saying? I'm saying that with, by assuming a separable solution, we've very impressively <laughs> been able to solve any situation for heat or matter flow where the initial condition happens to be sinusoidal. So let's paste in what that would look like. Let's imagine that we had a pipe in which the uh, the distribution of gas uh, was sinusoidal. What does that look like? Uh, let's let's even move this down a bit. So that's uh, that's what we're saying. The um, uh, the density looks like. So we're basically saying there's a there's a high density of gas there and there's a high density of gas there and so on down this pipe in exactly a sinusoidal um, oscillating way. Now that that's not very likely to happen. Right? I, don't, I can't think of a single initial condition for a diffusion problem where a sinusoidal uh, oscillation is a good approximation to how things start out. It's very, very restrictive. It's something, but it ain't much. How can we generalize? Well, this is where I think we're going to leave it for this lecture. But um, here's the crucial thing that will allow us to break free from this specific example and do vastly more powerful things. The differential equation that we were working with, the diffusion equation, is what's called a linear differential equation. What that means is that if we have any solution to the equation and then we find a different solution, we can add them together and it's still a solution. Why does that help? Well, when we worked this through, we made up some constant k. And for that constant k, we had just this very simple solution and a corresponding very simple initial condition that could go with this. That's one solution, one, comp one initial condition. But k can be anything we like. And if we were to add together solutions that had different values of the constant k, that would still solve our diffusion equation. 
That means that we can deal with an initial condition that's written as any sum of sines and coses with different values for k. And suddenly, flashback, we're in Fourier series territory. And so we'll capture this more properly at the beginning of the next lecture. But by thinking of just this very limited case, which shows us that signs and causes can be tackled, and the fact we're allowed to add together different solutions, we're in business. We can now, what we're going to find is that we can tackle any problem for which the initial condition can be described by a Fourier series. But what we just spent four lectures learning, or three plus Fourier transform, is that we can describe pretty much anything with a Fourier series. So we're going to be able to tackle very general problems because the diffusion equation allows us to add together different solutions. But we'll see the power of that. We'll see how it works in the next lecture. So thanks for listening.